Next, we have oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier blamed 10,000 cancelled appointments in Scarborough on a late Moderna shipment or a cancellation of the Moderna shipment. Now we hear from Scarborough Health that, in fact, that's not the reason for those 10,000 appointments to be cancelled. So can the, the Premier actually tell us why it was that 10,000 people in Scarborough had their appointments cancelled and are now waiting for another appointment to get a vaccination? Reply, Premier. For, for you, Mr. Speaker, to the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition under, has to understand the process, what we're going through. 300,000 300, Modernas arrived yesterday. 500,000 Pfizer, sorry, 400,000 Pfizer arrived Monday. The shipment that we expected from Moderna, an additional shipment this week, has been delayed again, I got noticed, May the 3rd. So how can you deliver the, the vaccinations the areas when we don't have the supply. It's, it's very simple, Mr. Speaker. If we had the supply, we give it to the public health units, they distribute it, and if they don't have it, they can't distribute it. It's not Scarborough's uh, fault. It's not Toronto's fault. We need the supply of vaccines. Simple as that. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, that's not what Scarborough Health says. Scarborough Health says it had nothing to do with the Moderna shipment delay. However, last week, the Premier promised that there was going to be a program in hotspots for vaccinating people over the age of 18. We find out, of course, that public health had no idea that this was coming. There were no extra vaccines provided. There were no extra resources provided to public health units. And then, Scarborough had 10,000 appointments pulled right out from under them. Here's what uh, one store, source uh, tells the Toronto Star, and I quote, they made an announcement without a plan or a supply to implement it. A, there was no supply. B, people couldn't register for appointments. C, there was no plan. What the heck is going on with the government? Why can't they get their act together and protect the people of this province from COVID-19? Because that's their job. Premier? For you, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition can get up and show up and down and scream and do cartwheels. That, that's fine. The bottom line is the Leader of the Opposition doesn't understand the process, doesn't have a clue about the process, how it's been working. Again. God bless the people of Scarborough. We're going to get them vaccines. There's three million, three million appointments been booked. We don't have the vaccines for three million people. It is simple as that. As soon as we get the vaccines, we'll be able to distribute it. We'll be able to get it out to the pharmacies with the AstraZeneca and the primary care. We'll be able to get the Moderna and the Pfizer out to the public health units. That will distribute it to the hospitals. It's not their fault because they, they, they have 10,000 additional appointments, didn't have the vaccines. There's only one government that's responsible for the supply of the vaccines. It's not the province, it's not the municipality, it's the federal government. We need the supply of the vaccines. Simple as that. The final supplementary. Well, I have news for the Premier. There's a distribution issue here in the province of Ontario, and that's his responsibility. But look, the Premier was warned back in February. Order. It is really clear. The warnings came from the experts back in February that we were going to end up exactly where we are now. We have over 650 patients now in the ICU, Speaker, and these aren't just numbers. These are people that are literally fighting for their lives, fighting to breathe, fighting this virus in ICUs. And of course, places like Scarborough are ground zero, where they're literally airlifting people to Ottawa to try to give them the care that they need. 
People failed. People were failed by this premier. He failed the people of Scarborough. So my question is, when is this government, when is this premier going to stop making excuses, stop blaming Order. everybody else, and start protecting those frontline essential workers, those health, uh, those frontline workers in Scarborough? Premier? You, Mr. Speaker, when the leader of the opposition is, is talking this way, uh, she does a disservice to the public. She does a disservice to our health partners, to the public health units that have been working their back off day in and day out. As the leader of the opposition sits there and, and throws barbs at, at everyone, when she hasn't even been involved from day one, has done zero, nothing, nothing at all to support the system, nothing to help out. As people up in Hamilton are struggling, what has the leader of the opposition done? Nothing. We're going to continue to focus on making sure that we get the vac vaccines. Part one of our plan is to limit mobility, to get the ICUs down with the people of, of this province. Response. Part two is we are going into high-priority neighbourhoods. We are going to high-priority companies within those neighbourhoods as we speak right now. It's happening. We, we, we saw it happen over the last four or five days. We're getting the job done. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Well, I can tell you for sure that I would have been listening to the scientists. I would have been following the instructions of uh, of the folks who were the experts who were giving this premier advice, but instead he didn't. He actually ignored the advice of experts and walked us right into this third wave, which is now completely out of control with his eyes wide open. There are a number of things that he could have and should have been doing, and I assure him I would have been doing them. I would have been doing them. Now, apparently, apparently order. Cabinet is meeting today. Government and so I'm asking the Premier yet again, as the experts have, as his own Chief Medical Officer of Health has, to start providing paid sick days to essential frontline workers, to all workers in Ontario. Start providing paid time off for vaccinations Question. for all Ontario workers so that they can have the tools to do the right thing. And I don't want to hear the malarkey about the federal program. It is, not a, a not, it is not a paid sick day. It's a benefit that you might or might not get. The opposition is doing it a service every time she stands up and speaks, every single time. She's telling the people that there's no paid sick days. Imagine the people at home listening to this that won't even, won't even apply to the federal government sick day program that we fought hard for, that we fought for $1.1 billion, Mr. Speaker. Order. There's $700 million. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? We're fortunate that 300,000 people in this province are smarter than the Leader of the Opposition because they did apply and they did get funding for sick pay. So I encourage every single Ontarian not to be double dipping. It doesn't matter if it says the government of Canada Order. or the government of Ontario. There's one taxpayer. One taxpayer, there's seven hundred million dollars sitting there for the people of Ontario to apply. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the disservice comes from a premier who doesn't want to do his job and acknowledge that people needs pay, need paid sick days. Not a, a program that you have to qualify for, that you have to jump through hoops for, that you may or may not get access to. Paid sick days occur in the moment. Training you don't have to wait for them. To you don't have to worry that your pay is going to be docked and then wait to, for even a week and a half, you have to you get them right away. And that's why every single expert, not just me, not just the leader of the opposition, every single expert has been telling this premier that those frontline heroes, those essential workers, the people he pretends to care about, the little guy, the little guy needs paid sick days. When will this pre premier do his job and protect those essential frontline workers with paid sick days and paid time off for vaccinations? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Talk about doing a job. Our team, the frontline health care workers, the docs, the nurses, paramedics, everyone, have been working Order. around the clock for well over a year, literally 24-7, every single day, trying to support the people of Ontario. And the negative talk that comes out of the Leader of the Opposition, again, does a disservice to all of the frontline health care heroes, all the people of Ontario. 
And it's ironic, it's coming from a person that has done diddly squat, nothing, zero, sat in her seat, and sits there and criticizes the hard work of the healthcare workers and the doctors that give me advice, no matter if it's Dr. Williams or Dr. Brown and the hundred doctors underneath them, or if it's Dr. Davila or Dr. Lowe, that, that all are giving advice, all Fox. working their back off. Why doesn't the leader of opposition do something? Do something positive once in a year and a half, because it's not even in her mindset to do something. Thank you. And this will be the final supplementary. Speaker, the people of Ontario deserve so much better than this. Folks are losing their lives. People are getting sick at unprecedented numbers. 650 people, 659 actually, in the ICU today, struggling to breathe. The virus continues to grow. Over 4,700 people in Ontario now have the virus. We've given this Premier all kinds of advice. We've asked him, we've begged him to listen to the experts, to follow their lead, to do what they're telling him to do. And instead, he walked us right into this third wave, into this this rampant spread of variants of concern. And now, you know, he seems to think that it's not his responsibility, that it had nothing to do with what he did or didn't do, the actions that he refused to take. Take the actions necessary. Take the actions that the experts are telling you to take. Bring in paid Question. sick days, bring in paid vax time, and stop the spread of this virus. Will the Premier do that? Amen. Premier. Mr. Speaker, it is so frustrating sitting here listening to the Leader of the Opposition the opposition's dis under order. disrespect Dr. Williams, disrespect Dr. Brown, Dr. Heyer. I could keep rattling all the doctors, all the CEOs that I talk to at least half a dozen every single day, giving a, advice, and the Leader of the Opposition wants to disrespect them. We have followed medical Ottawa, advice South come from day one. We have followed science from day one. And that is the reason we're doing more vaccinations than any. I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw. To withdraw. Free that is the reason we're leading the country in vac vaccinations. Bar none, no one even comes close to the amount of vaccinations. We're getting in excess of 100,000 vaccines out a day. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? We have 3,200 pharmacies. We're only at 1,400 Spons? pharmacies. We need more supply. We can ramp up well in excess of 300,000. I want to ask the, the opposition leader a question. What would happen if we would have Thank you. Thank you. vaccines Thank you. back in February Thank you. and March? Then you will take a seat. Order. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. There's no other way to say this right now. We are in the middle of a full-blown crisis. We're in the midst of the third wave, and vulnerable people are going to be paying the price for the Conservative government's inaction. More than just inaction, the Conservative government actually ignored critical information, advice, and pleas to act that could have avoided this third wave. They ignored calls to bring in greater support to COVID-19 hotspots. They ignored our hospitals who are warning about this third wave and overcrowding in our hospitals. They ignored experts who are calling for paid sick days. They ignored our teachers who are demanding for safer schools. They even ignored our doctors who are warning about this third wave for weeks and months now. Why? Did the, did the Conservative government, despite all these warnings, still decide to not act? To bring in the measures and urgency with the urgency that we needed to fight the third wave and stop this third wave. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. We have taken steps every step along the way since this pandemic began, realizing that we would need to enhance our hospital's capacity. Since this pandemic began, we have brought forward 3,100 new beds, enhanced our ICU capacity by 14 per cent, made significant investments in our hospital, over $15 billion so far, including $1.8 billion in the most recent budget to deal with the extra beds that have been brought on, to deal with the surgeries that, again, we unfortunately have had to delay because of this pandemic. 
We anticipated, as we saw the numbers rising and listened to the experts, listened to the doctors, Dr. Williams, Dr. Brown, and the science advisory table, the public health measures table. We brought in the uh, emergency uh, emergency break shutdown Response. and then realized we needed to have the uh, stay-at-home order. I'll speak more to the uh, preparations that we've taken as my supplementary speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, again to the minister. In communities like Brampton, and Peel that were the hardest hit by COVID-19 were in desperate need for help. But the Conservative government is still leaving Brampton behind despite the fact we are a COVID-19 hotspot and we are full of essential workers. Now, Brampton was left behind earlier in this pandemic and we had to fight tooth and nail to get the testing capacity that our city needed. Now we're being left, left behind once again by this Conservative government as we fight to get the vaccine to those who are most vulnerable in our community. Now, we knew this third wave was coming for weeks. Every single health expert in Canada was warning that Ontario was facing a third wave. Yet, despite these alarms being raised, the Conservative government decided to not act. And in the end, Brampton is suffering. So my question is this. When will the Conservative government finally question. decide to stop leaving Brampton behind and give Brampton access to the life-saving vaccine so we can fight and beat the COVID-19 pandemic? The government has heard it. The member opposite would know that Brampton is going to get a, a brand new hospital thanks to the hard work of uh, this Premier and this Minister of Health. But I have some advice to the member opposite. If he is really concerned that the federal uh, sick day program that his brother, the leader of the NDP, helped to negotiate along with this Premier, then he should pick up the phone, call his brother, and suggest to him that when the federal Liberal government delivers a budget, if it doesn't include enhancements that he is talking about, then he does not need to vote for that budget. If he thinks yeah. that the distribution of vaccines is not sufficient enough, that we haven't got a big enough supply, then I suggest Remember? the member opposite call his brother, the leader of the NDP in Ottawa, and suggest that he not just give him a blank check on a budget. Don't settle for a stretch goal again. Order. Your brother has the opportunity in Ottawa to ensure that Ontario gets the vaccines Response. that it needs. If there needs to be an, uh, an enhancement of uh, sick pay, he has the ability to do it. Pick up the phone and help me, Terry. Order. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as our government works to protect the health and well-being of Ontarians during this third wave, it remains my type, top priority to ensure that my constituents remain up to date on the latest news and advice and guidance on how to navigate this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, locally, I've compiled a website, vaccineupdate.ca, and held many teletown halls, bringing together our health units, local municipal leaders, to provide current information on vaccine availability, health guidelines to my local constituents. Imagine how frustrated I was, Mr. Speaker, when I received an email from a constituent in Grafton, and I quote, she writes, David, I'm writing to you today to inform you that I wasn't able to join your teletown hall nor go online to see its recording because our internet in Grafton is so bad that I was not able to participate effectively. We have had so many technicians, Question. new modems, ISPs, and we are on our third dish. Mr. Speaker, my community needs better broadband. They deserve better broadband. Mr. Speaker, would the minister please rise and inform the House, House what steps are taking? Thank you. Thank you very much. I recognize the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, for his tireless advocacy on this issue for his constituents in his riding. And right now, it is so imperative that we work quickly to get more households connected to high speed internet. How can anyone refute the fact that the lack of broadband is detrimental to the daily lives and livelihoods of too many Ontarians when stories like the members shared clearly indicate that people are being left behind? There's no question that the lack of internet is detrimental to daily, the daily lives and livelihoods of Ontarians, especially during this stay-at-home order. And having unreliable internet or even no service at all is simply unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly why I introduced the Supporting Broadband and Infrastructure Expansion Act 2021 that will reduce barriers faced by the telecommunications sector when it comes to building broadband faster. We're taking an innovative approach Thanks. so that everyone in Ontario can get reliable internet, no matter where they live. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, to meaningfully address broadband, it's more than just money. It's about measures that that minister just alluded to to reduce barriers in areas of rural Ontario like mine. Mr. Speaker, also, it helps when you invest money, and I'm proud of this government's historic $4 billion investment to broadband, the largest in Canadian history. Mr. Speaker, I recently joined PHO and the Port Hope Chamber and other chambers in my riding to discuss what was being done about poor broadband in our area and its impact on small business. We were pleased to share the $2.8 billion commitment in this budget and steps the minister alluded to to reduce barriers. Mr. Speaker, I think it was put best perhaps by the CEO of the Port Hope Chamber of Commerce. She said vital infrastructure such as broadband will help bridge gaps that are happening in these challenging times and improve life for our small businesses. Mr. Carson. Speaker, this is welcome news by the Port Hope Chamber of Commerce and chambers throughout my riding. Speaker, would the minister please share with the House what more we can expect from this historic investment? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and to the member opposite again, or the member for the question. Without healthy people, we can't have a healthy economy, and that's why we're focused on protecting every life and every job we possibly can during COVID. I too share the member's excitement because for almost 20 years. I've advocated for the expansion of broadband across Ontario, especially in rural and northern communities like the ones we represent. With our legislation and commitment of an additional $2.8 billion for a near total investment of almost $4 billion, we can help accelerate broadband expansion across all regions of this province. Mr. Speaker, I'm thrilled to say that finally this groundbreaking legislation has received royal assent and now shovels can get moving, Response. people can get connected, and Ontario can recover from COVID-19. Thank you. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Cases of COVID-19 in childcare centres are rising fast, and parents are worried that their children are no longer safe. There have been more than 1,000 cases reported in the last two weeks, including 134 cases yesterday alone. 25% of all childcare centre closures due to COVID-19 in the last 10 months have occurred in just the last two weeks. Experts like Dr. Janine McCready, an infectious disease specialist at McElgarren Hospital, are advising parents to pull their kids from childcare. What is the Premier doing to address this growing crisis? Mr. Speaker, we put in plan a put in, in plan a we've put a plan in place with $234 million of investment for childcare, recognizing how critical it is to keep kids safe, the staff themselves, and our communities at large. $234 million more dollars to help strengthen the the infection prevention prevention measures in place. That includes the cohorting of children in groups of 10 or less every day, the establishment of COVID-19 response plans the screening of all staff and all students' active screening before they enter these centres, daily attendance records, enhanced cleaning of the centres, mandatory PPE for the staff, and a no-visitor policy beyond essential visitors. We have followed all the advice of the medical officer about, which is why in this province over 91% of centres have no confirmed cases of COVID at all, and we're going to continue to follow the best medical advice, working closely with the Chief Medical Bond? Officer, because like the member opposite, we appreciate how critical childcare is right now as we work through this pandemic. Supplementary question. Speaker, childcare workers are working through the shutdown. They perform close care work with unmasked children who are too young to understand social distancing, children who need help going to the bathroom or changing their diaper. While education workers in hotspots are rightly receiving their vaccines, childcare workers are being left behind. Without childcare workers, essential workers can't go to work. We rely on childcare workers to keep our kids safe. Why won't the Premier immediately prioritize childcare workers for vaccinations? Then, Minister of Education. A commitment to make sure that our child care staff can get a vaccine, part of phase two, which we are in, as the Premier has rightfully noted. I think as every objective mind has acknowledged, the first step in defeating the pandemic is this province getting vaccine in the first place. And that responsibility rests to procure it with the federal government. 
When we get in Ontario, I assure the member opposite and every child care worker in this province that they will get access to the vaccine. But yes, individuals 55 years plus are eligible. Those 60 years plus are eligible as well for Pfizer and Moderna. In addition, Speaker, anyone who lives within a hot spot is eligible for the vaccine, particularly child care workers. And any, any child ECE that works within our schools, especially those that work with special education teachers uh, and students, can get access to the vaccine. We are making steps in the right direction. We realize there's more to do, and as vaccine comes to this province, we will get it out to the people of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. A question for the Premier. Sure. Good morning, Premier. Good Speaker, there are 653 people in intensive care units today. 4,736 new COVID cases and over a million doses of vaccines in freezers. And if we were administering the 150,000 doses daily, which we're not, that's about a week's supply. We're more around 100,000 doses a day, and that's about 10 days of supply. But Speaker, I don't, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty large buffer to hold back in a crisis. So the government says they're spoken for. But there is no transparency as to Your where the government come to delivers vaccines here in Ontario. So none of this, none of this makes any sense to Ontarians. So, Speaker, Question. through you, can the Premier explain why the government is keeping an almost 10-day stockpile of vaccines in freezers? To reply, Minister of Health. Speaker. Well, I can assure the member opposite that no amount is being held in freezers. It's not already allocated to people. We have already booked over 2.5 million appointments for people. That's using our booking tool. That doesn't even include the appointments that have booked, been booked in pharmacies, in personal care offices, in primary care offices, in hospital units as well. So those, unit, those allocations are already spoken for. Every dose that is in the freezer now has been booked already for an appointment for a person. We are deploying them as quickly as possible. Yesterday, we uh, vaccinated 105,500 people, and we're able to do more. We can triple, quadruple the number of vaccinations we can do every day if we have the vaccine supply. But as has been already indicated, the Moderna supply has been put, a, put off yet again. We're receiving the Pfizer vaccines, but we don't Response. know when we're receiving AstraZeneca, and the Moderna supply is also delayed. So as soon as we get them, we are putting them into people's arms as quickly as possible. The supplementary question. A million doses in freezers, and we're canceling appointments. That's all I'm gonna say. And the problem here is, for the Premier, it's been too much business as usual during this pandemic. He's been too focused on other things like Highway 413, paving over wetlands, or a couple of weeks ago, campaigning in Brampton. Ontarians need a Premier that's focused on keeping them safe from COVID-19. Last Friday, the Premier gave the impression that mobile units were out as he spoke vaccinating people in hotspot communities. And he said, if you're over 18 in those communities, you can get it. He did both of these things before public health units and the vaccine task force was ready. And then he has the temerity to say it's not complicated. Well, he's making it complicated. Question. People are angry and frustrated, and they have every right to be. So, Speaker, through you, can the Premier explain why he's announcing things? before the mechanisms to get it done are even close to being ready. And the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And I would say to the member through you, Mr. Speaker, that what you're suggesting is simply not the case. There is a plan that was developed Order. by working with Dr. Williams, with the Public Health Measures Table, and by the members of the Vaccine Distribution Task Force, as well as with the chiefs of all the hospitals in Ontario and the local medical officers of health in all 34 public health unit regions. The plan was developed with them. They have known about it since the beginning. The distribution for each amount of vaccine that is distributed to the public health units is then given to the units that are going to be uh, providing them. That is what happens. That is what was planned for. That is what we are doing now. And the fact that we've already distributed 3.5 million vaccines indicates that the plan is actually working.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Premier joined his counterparts from New Brunswick, Saskatchewan and Alberta to, uh, to welcome Alberta as a signatory to the Small Modular Reactors Memorandum of Understanding. Mr. Speaker, I gather that this news uh, generated, pun intended, a lot of excitement in the nuclear energy and sector and beyond. Mr. Speaker, this matters to the many hardworking men and women in the riding of Northumberland, Peterborough South, who get up every day to power our province, this nation. Mr. Speaker, will the Associate Minister of Energy please tell the House what yesterday's announcement means for the province, the people of Ontario, and the hardworking men and women of Northumberland, Peterborough South? Thank you, Speaker. The Associate Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, to the member from Northumberland, Peterborough says for that great question, and it did generate some great excitement here in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, small modular reactors, or SMRs, are a real game changer that have the potential to power Ontario's future job creation and export opportunities. We're thrilled to welcome our friends from Alberta to the table to be part of the next generation of nuclear technology. A feasibility study was also released, confirming that SMRs represent an important solution for our unique energy challenges, such as powering remote and rural communities that currently rely on expensive diesel power. I thank Ontario Power Generation, Bruce Power, New Brunswick Power, and Saskatchewan Power for their work in preparing the study, which will help us plan for development and employment of SMR technology in coming years. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is leading the way when it comes to SMR development, just like we did with the development of can-do technology, and we are excited about how SMRs can contribute to a clean and reliable energy and environmental future for our province and our country. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we welcome that news, constituents of Northumberland, Peterborough South. I know a number of which were very uh, scared three years ago uh, when they heard members opposite talk about shutting down this sector, so this is welcome news. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to reference a note I received from a constituent of mine, Mike, in Newcastle, who said, Dave, this groundbreaking technology has so much potential, and I applaud this government for its leadership in this area. Mr. Speaker, it's for hardworking men and women, people like Mike, that we get up every day to make this province a better place, to invest in groundbreaking technology like this. So, Mr. Speaker, my question back to the Associate Minister. Can you please tell us more about ways that SMR can be utilized to benefit this economy in Ontario and the hardworking men and women of Northumberland, Peterborough South? Thank you, Speaker. The Associate Minister. Thank you again, Speaker, and thank you to Mike and the member for Northumberland Peterborough South for another great question. SMR development represents an immense opportunity for Ontario to become a leading exporter of technology and expertise that can address global issues such as climate change and energy reliability and further strengthen Ontario's position as the global leader in the supply of life-saving medical isotopes. SMRs could offer energy-intensive industries, such as mining and manufacturing, a safe, lower-cost source of clean, safe energy and enhance their competitiveness. SMRs also have the potential for innovations beyond electricity generation, Mr. Speaker, such as supplying heat or steam for industrial processes or producing hydrogen, which is another clean resource that our government is very interested in developing. Mr. Speaker, the possibilities are truly endless. For a sustainable, made in Ontario supply chain and jobs, and I share the members' enthusiasm for the Ontario's future as a world Response. leader in nuclear energy. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This stay-at-home order and the school shutdown could have been avoided if this government invested in the safety of Ontarians. There were over 8,000 cases this weekend and over 65% of the cases were between, between the ages of 20 and 59. This age group represents a majority of Brampton's workforce, and they mostly work in frontline occupations such as transportation and manufacturing. They are being heavily impacted by this government's inaction. They need paid sick days. I'll say this once again. They need paid sick days and it is critical to stopping workplace outbreaks to keep our frontline workers safe and stop the spread of COVID-19. My question to the Premier, when will this government help them by mandating paid sick days? Mr. Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, and I'm pleased to respond to the uh, member's question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there is now uh, four weeks of paid sick days for every worker in Ontario. I would remind uh, every worker in Ontario uh, to go to canada.ca forward slash COVID-19, and they, they can apply uh, for those paid sick days. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, furthermore, 
uh, the members opposite should let their constituents know that there's 20 days or four weeks of paid sick days available uh, to each and every one of uh, their workers and their constituents. Uh, in fact, Mr. Speaker, more than 300,000 people uh, in Ontario uh, have either received the benefit or are receiving the benefit as we speak, and will continue to advocate to the federal government to always be there for Ontario workers. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me tell you how it really works. We just heard the member opposite. I'm going to educate him as to the way it really works. Workers cannot rely on the CRB as a replacement for paid sick days. They cannot apply for the CRB if they take a day off to go get tested. There's a reason why health officials, such as Dr. Lawrence Lowe, have been advocating for paid sick days, because they know the CRB is not enough to stop the spread of COVID-19. And the Premier earlier said he was listening to health experts, but obviously he's not listening to Dr. Lowe. Our frontline workers that are being impacted heavily by the virus and all the new variants need relief and they need paid sick days. The Premier says, Mr. Speaker, he doesn't make any decisions by himself and that he listens to health officials. Question. So instead of accusing the NDP of playing politics, why won't he listen to health officials like Dr. Lowe when they're asking for paid sick days? Mr. Speaker, uh, the very first uh, piece of action that our government took when uh, COVID-19 hit Ontario was to bring in job-protected leave. I'm proud to say that we led North America. In fact, Mr. Speaker, Order. if any worker out there uh, is in self-isolation. If they're in quarantine, if you're a mom or a dad, order. for example, that has to stay home and look after uh, a son or a daughter because of the disruptions to the school system, you can't be fired for that. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we were the very first jurisdiction to bring forward job protected leave for those getting vaccinations. And I have to say it was just last week that the NDP government in British Columbia reached out to my office. We helped them. They're drafting legislation now to bring in job protected leave for, for vaccinations. But we were the first ones to do that, supported by all members in this House. But Mr. Speaker, every member is Response? doing a disservice to their constituents when they don't tell workers in their own local communities that there's 20 paid sick days available to yeah, each and every one of them. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Shortly after the Premier issued, issued yet another stay-at-home order, my constituency office started to receive an increase in calls asking for clarity and reasoning behind these new rules. In one instance, a gentleman was denied the opportunity to purchase batteries for his smoke alarm from a store because the clerk said it was non-essential. Another individual said that the local Dollarama would not sell them school and office supplies as it was deemed non-essential. A constituent was even barred from purchasing sandwich bags at Sobeys, again, because they were deemed non-essential. My question to the Premier is, after saying for months on end that restricting stores from selling, quote, non-essential items would be detrimental and impractical, what signs did he follow that persuaded him to flip-flop on this messaging and how did he determine what makes an item essential or non-essential? Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, if the member opposite is not willing to um, educate and inform her constituents, I'm happy to do that. The reality is, from the beginning, businesses across Ontario have been allowed to provide curbside service. It's safer, it protects the customers, it protects their employees, and it also allows individuals who need to purchase things for their family to get that safely. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Aside from her childish jab, what this government has done is pushed those who can shop online to do just that. Once again, favoring the big box stores over our local small businesses. Not everyone can afford a lobbyist, Mr. Speaker, especially ones who used to work or volunteer with any of those who serve on the government benches. What we are seeing is a lack of science behind decisions that are having detrimental effects on the small business owners and their families in this province. Mr. Speaker, this new stay-at-home order is wrong, and the restrictions that come with it are confusing, heavy-handed, and ineffective. It is insulting to Ontarians to know that pot and booze are essential, but car seats for children are not. So I ask, again, why did the Premier and this government change their stance on placing restrictions on businesses from selling certain goods? Solicitor General. Speaker, the short answer is because lives were at stake. 
we have instituted a stay-at-home order to protect the most number of Ontario citizens. It truly is the difference between ensuring that we can protect the vast majority of people. If people understand that allowing the movement of individuals is actually leading to more transmission rates, then we need to, to send a clear message that says, stay at home, order online, pick up by curbside, do your delivery models, because at the end of the day, it will protect your family, it will protect your neighbours, it will protect your community, and ensure that we have the necessary medical resources to make sure that if someone unfortunately catches Response. COVID, then we can protect them in our hospitals. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for Northumberland, Peter Burleson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to serve in a government that is committed to standing up for victims of crime and supporting the growth of safer communities in every corner of the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, recently the Attorney General announced new sexual violence support services for historically underserviced regions of the province of Ontario and the province-wide expansion of free legal advice for survivors of sexual assault no matter where they live. Mr. Speaker, this matters for rural and small-town Ontario. Yesterday, the Attorney General recognized the exceptional achievements in the service of victims of crime across Ontario through the Victim Services Award of Distinction. Could the Attorney General please share the importance of celebrating these heroes and their vital work for communities? Thank you. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, my colleague and friend, for the chance to honour with him the remarkable contributions of 15 individuals and organizations from across the province who have been recognized through the Victim Services Awards of Distinction. In the face of unprecedented challenges, these dedicated professionals, generous volunteers and outstanding organizations have demonstrated an impressive drive to raise awareness of victims' issues increase access to crisis intervention services, and provide compassionate support in times of need. This rec recognition highlights the dedication and creativity of professionals and volunteers who serve victims and the courageous efforts of individuals who have been personally impacted by crime and are now working to raise the profile of victims' issues in Ontario, including in rural, northern, and Indigenous communities. I want to congratulate and celebrate each and every remarkable recipient on the important impacts their service to victims of crime are having in their communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Attorney General for recognizing these heroes who go above and beyond to support victims of crime and survivors across the province of Ontario. In my region, we are proud of the work that is done on a daily basis by dedicated professionals, volunteers, organizations, and partners. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to particularly highlight the great work being done by Peterborough Police Services. Mr. Speaker, I know there's been groundbreaking work done there with the Peterborough Police Victim Services Unit. We are proud of the work of Alice Zitram and Facility Dog Pixie. They've been accomplishing remarkable work at the unit. And I applaud the Attorney General for shining a light on these important efforts. Mr. Speaker, can the Attorney General tell us about this remarkable pair of recipients? Thank you. The Attorney General. Thank you again for the question and speaker and the chance to speak about this deserving team of recipients. Alice Zitram is a social worker and civilian coordinator with the Peterborough Police Victim Services Unit who developed its first facility dog program. She is the primary handler of Pixie, a five-year-old accredited facility dog, and you can follow Pixie on Instagram if you wish. Pixie helps provide people experiencing trauma with positive physical and neurological impacts. Since the program began just over a year ago, Pixie has provided critical support to victims of crime at court, police, police scenes, interviews, meetings, stress debriefings, and community presentations. Alice's creativity her champions the use of canine-assisted intervention. Speaker, the story of Alice and Pixie is one of 15 recognized by the Victim Services Awards of Distinction, and I encourage all the members of the House to share stories from their regions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question the member for London North Centre. My question is to the Premier. Agri-foods is an important pillar in London's economy, and a business is only as strong as the people who work there. Frontline workers are responsible for the high-quality food on our table. This week, the member from London Fanshawe, London West, and I learned that over 80 essential workers at Cargill, people who don't have the luxury of working from home or physically distancing in the workplace, contracted COVID-19. Right now, we're thinking of all the workers and their families. 
Without provincial paid sick days, <clears throat> our food supply chain is under attack. Thankfully, Cargill stepped up and supported workers with paid sick leave while this government stepped aside. Denying frontline essential workers paid sick days means that many people can't take the time off when they're feeling unwell, which puts us all at risk. When will this government listen to experts, listen to doctors, listen to nurses, listen to the legion of people calling on them to step up, show some responsibility, and provide provincial paid sick days? Mr. Labour. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. I do want to begin by thanking uh, all of those farmers, all of those farm here, workers, here. all of those agri-food uh, workers who have ensured that every single day in the province of Ontario, all of us have had food on our plates uh, at, the, at the dinner table. Mr. Speaker, uh, I think about all those cargo workers, and I do want to say thank you, Cargo, for stepping up, for paying those workers who uh, are not going to be on the job for the next number of uh, days. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the province Order. of Ontario, 2.3 million workers actually have paid sick days through their employers. For everyone else, I plead with the NDP, with the provincial Liberals, with all elected officials, please tell these workers to go to canada.ca forward slash COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, 300,000 workers in the province are receiving this benefit. Response? It's a responsibility for all of us to let them know that these supports are in place. The opposition will come to order. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. This is a serious hit to London's economy and our food supply chain. But first and foremost, this government didn't listen to scientific advice to vaccinate frontline workers who want to get their shot. It's even more disturbing that this government is now shirking its responsibility by having employers and hotspots set up their own vaccination clinics for workers in the community and then sticking them with the bill. The Premier's mouth tells workers and businesses he stands shoulder to shoulder with them, but his actions say something completely different. Paid sick days protect our economy. Paid sick days protect our food chain. Paid sick days save lives. Does this government truly want to protect Ontario workers, or would they rather save a buck? Mr. Speaker, I am proud that more than 3.4 million people in the province of Ontario have received a vaccination as of yesterday, Mr. Speaker, with millions more ready to, to be vaccinated. They booked those appointments. But, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite has to, and, and, and his party, they need to work with us to Wait call on the federal government to get us more vaccines. The supply issue is a real challenge in London, in every other community uh, across this province. But, Mr. Speaker, as a ministry, we are sparing no expense to protect the health and safety of workers. I'm proud to say that as of today, Mr. Speaker, we've done about 47,000 workplace inspections. We've hired 100 more Ministry of Labour Training and Skills Development uh, inspectors, something that that member opposite voted against. We will stand with workers Response. every single day to get through COVID-19. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, Monday was a devastating day for people in Sudbury. More than 150 members of their community working at Laurentian University were told that they were without a job in the middle of the pandemic because the university had to cut nearly 70 programs. I know the government has been saying that it can't get involved while the CCAA process is ongoing, but the government knew these program cuts and job losses were coming months ago before the process began. So I would like to ask the minister, why didn't the government act before February 1st to collaborate on a made in Sudbury solution and protect all those affected by Monday's cuts? The parliamentary assistant and member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, let me be clear that I understand the very difficult and personal situation affecting students, families, and workers at Laurentian University. The courses of 90% of students, Mr. Speaker, have not been affected, and for the 10% of those who have, we are working directly with the institution, who are working in turn with each student to ensure a pathway for graduation. Mr. Speaker, 
The member asserts uh, information prior uh, to uh, prior to to knowing the CCAA protection proceedings. Mr. Speaker, what I can tell you is that the gravity of Laurentian's financial situation only was very recently brought to the government's attention. Mr. Speaker, it's been widely reported that Laurentian University has over 300 million in liabilities. And Mr. Speaker, we've appointed Dr. Alan Harrison to have a look at this and to provide independent and Response. thoughtful analysis to ensure that we make meaningful decisions going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. And again, to uh, the Minister for Colleges and University, Laurentian is a nor northern institution that serves Indigenous and Francophone communities that are largely underserved by provincial services. 45% of French language programming is being cut, and the Indigenous Studies program has been cut entirely. The institution does not only support these communities, but it also supports the vitality of Sudbury as a whole. When students leave the region to complete their studies, most of them won't come back. For the Francophone community, the impact is on the survival of our culture in the North. The government has taken symbolic steps to recognize the important role franco ontarians play in our society. So my question is, what does the government intend to do concretely to support the right to study in French for our franco ontarian community in Northern Ontario? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to address that. The member opposite said symbolic. Well, I can assure the member opposite there's nothing symbolic about 17.6 million to expand French language programming in the post-secondary sector, providing more opportunities for Francophone students. Nothing symbolic of the 74 million to support over 30,000 Ontarian students who enroll in French language programming across Ontario. That member is from the National Capital Region. I would encourage her to work with us, work with the federal government, who contribute one-fifth of what this government contributes to French language programming in the province of Ontario, one-fifth. We know the Official Languages Act talks about the importance of, of bilingualism in this country and the important role that Francophones uh, play in the province of Ontario. So I would encourage that member opposite Response. to work with us, work with us to grow on the, French lang the first ever Franco University governed by and for Francophones. And in addition, Mr. Speaker, to work Thank you. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Minister of Colleges and Universities allowed the CCA process to fire over 100 people and slash nearly 70 programs at Laurentian University. One of those programs was midwifery. I want to remind you, Speaker, Laurentian has the only French Ecole de Profession de Sage Femme outside of Quebec. It is the only bilingual midwifery program in the entire country. I spoke with Lisa Morgan, the director of the program. She said other midwifery schools are valued and protected as rare and necessary because there's only six of them in Canada. Lisa was told her program was cut due to low enrollment, which is confusing because Laurentian's program is the largest school of midwifery in Canada. Speaker, this program is managed by the Ministry of Health, which caps the enrollment at 30 students a year, even though they turn away hundreds of students every year. My question, Speaker, is for you. Will the government finally realize how ridiculous the CCA process has been, reverse the harmful cuts that were made to Laurentian University's programs? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I do acknowledge and understand the rare and necessary programming of midwifery. That's why, Mr. Speaker, this government provided an additional million dollars to Laurentian University, dedicated specifically for the midwifery program. But, Mr. Speaker, the real question here, and the member alluded to it, is: Is it the position of the NDP? for government to now get involved in specific programming at every university across the province of Ontario who are autonomous governing institutions. Is that the position of the NDP? Is it the position of the NDP to interfere in court proceedings? If so, be honest with Ontarians and just tell them that. Thank you, Speaker. Be supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the CCA process is not meant for public institutions. It's a brutal process that's made to satisfy bankers. As long as they get paid, they don't care what cuts are being made, and there's a conservatives in their pocket. Our university is a community, and we care about all the cuts that are being made, especially when they don't make sense. 100 percent of midwifery graduates have been hired. Laurentian midwives make up one-third of all midwives in Ontario and in Canada. Alison Crows is a midwifery student at Laurentian. She said, I have exposed myself to COVID for the last year in order to serve the Ontario population. I've moved more than 10 times for placements. I've completed unpaid placements. 
I've acquired significant student debt. I face extended separation from my support systems, and I now have no clear path to graduation or registration to the profession. This cut is unconscionable. He can pivot and dance and sidestep and hide, but I want the Premier to answer, will the Premier do the right thing for Northern students like Allison and Question. fund Laurentian to save programs like midwifery? In the parliamentary system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, we understand the important role midwives play across this country and in the province of Ontario. That's why this government provided a million additional dollars to Laurentian University uh, to support that programming. But again, the underlying issue here that that member refuses to address is that he believes that politicians know better than our autonomous institutions on what programming to offer, Mr. Speaker, that politicians know better than independent court cases. We know that when it comes to the independent processes when it comes to court proceedings, they could care less. They want politicians making all these decisions. Mr. Speaker, we understand the important role that the government does play. That's why we're working with the institution to ensure pathway to graduation for the 10 percent of students affected at Laurentian University, individualized pathways for each. We're going to continue doing just that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, we know that the pandemic is not being experienced in a uniform way across the province. While many parts of the province have low case numbers and live in circumstances that help facilitate successful safety measures such as staying home and maintaining distance from others, my riding of Scarborough Guildwoods does not have the same options. Scarborough Guildwood has been a COVID hotspot since the beginning of the pandemic. A disproportionate number of residents cannot work from home. They are essential and frontline workers. Dense housing and multi-generational family homes, community transmission is also a continuing problem, with a 24 per cent positivity rate more than twice the provincial average. This reflects the numbers of cases in Scarborough. The vaccine rollout has been unnecessarily com complicated and confusing for Ontarians, especially newcomers and seniors. They've faced many barriers booking their vaccine. What is the provincial government doing to make vaccines more accessible instead of chaotic by closing hospital-run vaccination clinics in hotspots like Scarborough? Thank you. And the Minister of Health to respond. Speaker, and we have been clear that phase two of our vaccine rollout will focus on age and risk while also focusing on hotspots across the province. There have been 114 hotspots identified through postal codes where we understand that there are barriers to people receiving vaccines. There's vaccine hesitancy. There may be language problems. There may be other issues involved with it. We are doing uh, vaccinating people through the uh, through the vaccine clinics we also are doing mobile clinics and pop-up testing going to apartment buildings going to other locations using using faith-based um, organizations as well because these are trusted organizations that people depend upon and rely upon and we're finding that that's really dealing with the vaccine hesitancy but with respect to the issue about the uh, shortage in, in the vaccination clinics it's important very important Response. to remind the member that that local public health units are responsible for the managing and overseeing the distribution and administration of the vaccines across their entire region. Similarly, clinics are expected to administer the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Speaker, back to the minister. You know, 10,000 people in my riding and across Scarborough are now out of luck. They are having to re rebook their vac vaccinations. I was there yesterday at Centennial College. I met Lisita. She is 74 years old. She has had an appointment booked for weeks. She came an hour early for her appointment, had to be turned away. 69-year-old Ramjeet, he rode his bike to get his vaccine, only to be turned away. So the, I understand that we are all in this together. We need to roll this vaccination program out across Across the province. However, we cannot keep passing the buck on others. It, it's not the local public health's um, responsibility to coordinate the distribution. That, well, the distribution is decided by the province. If you're telling me Question. that that's not the responsibility, then we've got more to do. But, Mr. Speaker, I'm asking this minister, will they send Scarborough an equitable share of vaccines so that they can vaccinate the thousands of people who lost their appointment yesterday. Thank you. Minister of Health. 
Speaker, and through you, uh, Speaker, I can assure the member that Scarborough is receiving an equitable distribution of vaccines, as is every other part of Ontario. It's based on uh, age and based on risk, and taking into account the numerous hotspots that we understand Scarborough has within its geography. But we have been working hand in glove with local public health units to ensure that there are clear expectations about what allocations public health units and vaccine sites will be receiving. And to be clear, Toronto Public Health has their own Toronto vaccine table that determines how their allocation is distributed within the city. So we know that delayed uh, vaccines are extremely disruptive, but we are working with those local public health units so that they know what allocation they will be receiving, and then they distribute that Response. allocation to all of the vaccine sites. So that is something that we are going to continue to work on with them, but be sure that Scarborough is receiving their equitable share. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. St. Catharines City Council just passed a motion about commercial insurance gouging. They want action. In October, you acted surprised at commercial insurance gouging that you described as astronomical. And wait for the next budget. It was more of the same tough talk that stops after you leave the podium. What's the cost of no action? In St. Catharines, the Mistopoulos family owns three hotels, and in December, their insurance rate increased by 300% almost $200,000 over the pandemic. That's more than all federal and provincial pandemic supports combined. Question. Will this government step in to do something meaningful to protect our small businesses affected by insurance profiteering? And finally, will this government finally take action on commercial insurance? To reply, the government has to uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I know that the Minister of Finance has been working very closely with uh, with the industry, and more importantly, has been working with uh, small, medium, and large uh, job creators to ensure that the economy continues to grow post-pandemic, as it uh, uh, really did before the uh, the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. As I said a couple of days ago in this House, uh, uh, back in 2018, the people of the province of Ontario voted for a government that could focus on their priorities, and their priorities, of course were job creation. The number one priority was job creation. We saw thousands of jobs coming back to the province of Ontario following the disastrous 15-year uh, government of the previous Liberal, uh, of the Liberal regime, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but let the member uh, rest assured that this government will continue to focus on small, medium, and large job creators, continue to focus on the tourism uh, industry like uh, she, just messaged, uh, Order. she just mentioned in her question. I know she's now hollering and doesn't apparently want to hear the answer, Mr. Speaker, but I guess that's typical of the Response. NDP. Lots of holler, lots of bluster, no action. And so, question period comes to an end. <laughs> Next, we have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the motion for third reading of Bill 254, an act to amend various acts with respect to elections and members of the Assembly. On April 13, 2021, Mr. Downey moved third reading of Bill 254. On April 14, 2021, Mr. Nichols moved that the question be now put. Bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes on Mr. Nichols' motion that the question be now put. I will ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies.